So I'd like to welcome you and welcome my guest, Dana Shaddad. Uh, Dana, I'm going to uh, read from my uh, cheat sheet, basically. A founder of Intiaz Middle East uh, a professional services company specialized in developing organizational capabilities in the areas of applied innovation and entrepreneurship development. That is big. And uh, Dana actually uh, invests 8% of her time in working on more of uh, uh, social impact projects, including the uh, um, Arab uh, Mobile Challenge. Uh, and that's it about Dana. We don't want to get into Dana. Uh, uh, yeah, let's, let's, uh, let's talk about the topic of the uh, session. So we're here in, in, an, in two days about a conference about entrepreneurship in the region and what's happening in Egypt and other Arab countries. Um, and I'm going to be the devil's advocate here and ask about what is it that has to be done before we reach the entrepreneurship level in the region, especially when it comes to youth. Hi, everyone. Sorry about my voice, but the environment in Cairo is not working for me. So um, if it gets annoying, tell me to shut up. Um, <laughs> so... Um, before we get to entrepreneurship, so the focus of the work that we're doing, which you mentioned, is around social impact. And um, we've been doing this for three to four years, deploying all these development programs in entrepreneurship, but using entrepreneurship as a vehicle for, you know, upskilling and, and bringing more awareness and education to young people across the MENA region. So before you get to the entrepreneurship stage, there's a huge educational piece that needs to come into play. So having your own business um, that is successful, generating revenues, raising money, exiting, all of, all of this is a lot of work. And before you even get there, you need to understand the market, you need to understand how your product is going to sell, what needs are you meeting, um, how you can sustain yourself uh, against competition. Um, is your offering local? Is it regional? Is it international? How big can you get? What your potential is? The team that you're going to require? All of these things are a huge educational piece that needs to come into play. What's happening at the moment is a lot of young people are jumping into on the entrepreneurship bandwagon and very quickly realizing that there's a lot of hard work that goes into it. So we hear a lot about um, raising funds, but really there's a piece, for example, around, do you really want to dilute your equity now? Do you, can you generate more revenue before you go and raise funds? There are a lot of gaps in the understanding and the, in the let's call it the, the optimal way of going about this. But I mean, these, these are just lessons and part of a journey that, um, that we're all undertaking, I think. Um, do you think that entrepreneurship is actually um, a trend that is covering on the grassroots uh, work that should happen with youth before they actually reach that technical side of education, which you mentioned. Let's say uh, the education systems and in, in the Arab world in general are, are, are relatively bad, and the production of, uh, uh, of the education system is not that good for, and, and the, the youth are not even ready to, um, to, to learn the skills that you, you mentioned, the technical skills that are related to entrepreneurship. What are we missing on that grassroots level when, when it comes to youth empowerment in the region? I actually don't think what, what we're missing is the technical skills. The technical skills, you know, the way that I hear it is, you know, kind of um, development, tech, IT, and I think we've got plenty of competencies across that. What we're lacking is the business, right? And the business skills are acquired via formal education and informal education. Um, but the entrepreneurial piece is, you know, I think, you know, somebody said, I think it was yesterday, said it was a mindset. I say it's a lifestyle. It's not, for me, it's not a mindset. It's how you live. It's a choice of how you live every day. Uh, but more importantly, in today's world and across, you know, your question, I think it's become a culture. It's become a culture that youth are aspiring to be a part of as, a, as an answer to a problem. And the problem is lack of jobs, lack of opportunity. Um, and everybody wants to have a dream and everybody has an ambition and everybody wants to go somewhere except our governments in this part of the world are not moving fast enough to generate enough potential dreams for everybody. 
to say this mildly, you know? And therefore, entrepreneurship has become a way for young people to drive their potential dreams. And some of them are gonna acquire skills on this path where they're gonna end up being entrepreneurs, some successful and some not. And some of them are gonna end up in jobs. In fact, I dare say a lot of people end up in jobs. I agree. Um, so you, you were saying that um, entrepreneurship actually is, is, is a solution for a bigger problem, which is employment in the region. Um, why are we focusing on entrepreneurship versus actually the readiness of the youth for the job market? Because part of the unemployment issue in the region is the readiness of youth for the job market. It's not only about not uh, the non-existence of, of, of job, or job opportunities. And we see a lot of problems when it comes to big corporates. When, when they want to hire youth, they, they can't really find the caliber that they're looking for. Um, uh, why, why are we only focusing on creating job opportunities for youth, but youth are not really ready for these, jo these job opportunities? Um, I, think, I think you've grasped kind of the whole, whole piece, and I just want to break it down, because when we're talking about youth, you're talking about different segments. Um, and by segments, I mean, you know, living in cities, living in rural areas, have an education, don't have an education, have post education don't have it so there are many segments so the answer is not one or the other from a job creation perspective I think there are multiple mandates entrepreneurship is one and entrepreneurship is going to work out for your grade A and B entrepreneurs predominantly and what I mean by that is a segment of youth who've gone to university who've got a certain level of education a certain level of exposure and a certain level of access to opportunity that allowed them to make this potential business happen and a lot of the young people that we see here at Rise Up are sitting in A and B, okay? Um, then you go to C and D, and then even below that, and then you start looking at other mandates, and these mandates can be micro-enterprise, which means these young people sitting out in rural areas working on farms, you know, you know doing, you know, like hands and crafts and, you know, tailoring, et cetera. These are also legitimate businesses. They're providing service, but they need $20 for a month as opposed to 20,000. So micro-enterprise is a huge part of, of, of the piece in terms of a job creation point of view and sustainability point of view for micro-enterprise. And then the third, the third piece is education. And that what goes into that is training programs. It's about um, acknowledging gender issues. It's about acknowledging policy, regulation, and all of these things that might come into play while you have your own business or even in employment and how to manage those. So there are three different parts here. I don't think one piece is more than important than the other because they each speak to a different audience. Um, so for example, Karim, he spoke earlier, the, the founder of Karim. He's not quite facing it yet in the region, but Uber, which is essentially the concept that he's, you know, duplicated, but in a better way, has had massive issues worldwide from a, a policy and regulation, legalities. So even though it's a unicorn company, meaning it's worth billions of dollars, it's actually running into a lot of issues. So they're also learning as they go along and they're pulling out of some markets and lobbying and others. And so yeah, so this is it, it's, it's a spectrum. All right. Um, I'll give the questions to the floor. I'm done with my, my questions. And, uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, any questions? Because you warned me already that someone will, will, will ask a lot of uh, tough questions. And I, I, I'm looking forward to this, actually. <laughs> if not, I'm going to continue. So, uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's that for you, actually. <laughs> I'm not from Saudi Arabia. Uh. I'm not from Saudi Arabia, but I've worked with a lot of young women in the startup space who are coming from Saudi. And I'm telling you, they are incredible. I mean, uh, okay, this is going to sound controversial, but I'm pro ladies. 
I'm, I'm pro, pro the ladies. ladies. <laughs> I'm pro the ladies. Um, and a lot of uh, a lot of young women now are becoming so much braver and taking the steps that they want to take to do what they want to do. It was never about the issue of competency or ability or drive or ambition. Women always had that. But it's about, you know, culture, tradition, expectations, et cetera, et cetera. But it's shifting. And a lot of young women are stepping out. Last year, we had a, I had a team of women come out from Algeria to Dubai. We flew them out to pitch. And these girls came from some town in Algeria. They were wearing their traditional dress code. They looked very different to everybody else. Very different. But they sat in front, or they stood in front of a panel of judges, international judges, and they pitched their concept. And they were so confident and so incredible and so well prepared. They won. They won. So the odds can work in your favor. In fact, I think they're more likely to work in your favor than not. You just have to take a step. Uh, your own destiny and your own options in life as opposed to, you know, go to university and hope for the best in terms of employment opportunities. Um, the reality is populations are growing way quicker than jobs are being created. In fact, there are less and less jobs now. You know, technology and the, and the, and the track that we're heading in is actually meaning that there is less need for humans in the workplace because it's becoming more automated, artificial intelligence is taking over, and therefore there's less and less need for us. So what happens to people who want to feed their families at the end of the day? You know, and that's, and that's I, think, I think really simply, that's what it boils down to. Um, people wanna believe, young people need hope. They need to believe that there's something out there that they, that they can do something about. And that's why this culture is, I think, imperative as a notion right now where times are a little bit dark in this part of the world uh, and them creating opportunities for themselves. Okay, uh, I'll go back to my questions basically. Um, I have two questions. One is, do you think that this uh, buzz about entrepreneurship and the trends that are taking place are actually causing damage between youth as much as they are being uh, helpful? because uh, a lot of youth are actually stepping off their jobs, their full-time jobs that are very sustainable and very, very stable to go and um, uh, experiment the entrepreneurship uh, scene with ideas that are not really viable. Then they uh, end up failing and not able to get back to their jobs because, um, because the lack of, of jobs for, for these people in specific uh, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the region uh, wouldn't allow them to find uh, uh, their jobs again. So what do you think about this? I don't know. I mean, this is, this is a personal opinion. There's no right or wrong, I think, to this answer. But my personal, my personal view on this is if you have enough passion and drive and guts to, like, drop, you know, the bird in the hand to go and pursue the two on the tree... Even if you fail, that's not really a failure. I mean, we've all come across the million and one courses about it's not failing, it's learning, right? So this is a learning experience. 
I mean, I've been running my own business for six, seven years now, and I've invested in businesses. My first investment was worth over $100,000, and I burnt it. My father had a heart attack. He's like, how do you invest and just burn money? Like, how do you do that? And I'm like, but it's like, you know, you got to take risks. And he's like, what? Like, go buy property. That's what people do. Because that's the traditional way of thinking, right? It's more secure. It's da -da -da. So if you're risk averse by DNA and willing to push yourself and do it, then even if you doesn't work out once, it might work, you know, you'll try again and again and again. I think the tenacity and resilience of people like that will not, will not leave them without options. I think eventually they create their own options. But I do think it's damaging when people have a false sense of capabilities. No, exactly, that's what I'm referring to, basically. Well, you know, there is false sense of self-esteem, and there's false sense of confidence in life, and, there's false, and sometimes you fake it till you make it. <laughs> we, we've all met a few people who are like that, I'm sure, right? Um, but it's a journey. Like, I, I, there's no answer there. It's a journey. Some people have to fall on their, on their face once to learn, and some need 10 times. And it's just, that's just the way it is. But I do not think that taking risks is a bad thing. I can't. It's against my DNA to tell you that it's a bad thing. Uh, it's also I think you need mine, to be but calculated, yeah. but I don't, think, I don't think it's a bad thing. Um, how about um, the importance of taking this show, what, what, happens, what happened during these day, two days, to, to, act, to school campuses? Do you think that entrepreneurship education should happen on a lower level when it comes to school students before they actually graduate and go to universities and stuff like that? 100%. And whether the formal system wants to do that or not, it's happening by default. Look at the gamification of education that we're witnessing today. So children are learning through games. They're learning through coding. They're learning through playing, you know, the making culture. And therefore, whether... Again, governments are institutionalizing this new way of education, education where you know, entrepreneurship is becoming part of the culture or not. Younger generations actually, in my opinion, have a better chance because the level of awareness is way higher. Like you get a two-year-old nowadays and they'll come up to a plasma screen and they'll be like this. And I'm still using a Blackberry. <laughs> You know what I mean? I noticed. So it's, it's, it's very, it's become so intuitive. It's become so like instinctual, like it's just part of how younger people are operating, how, you know, what apps they're using and, um, and just how, they, how they're wired. So I think by default, they are actually have a better chance at doing this. I think it's the roughest on the current generations that we're this time right now. I think that's kind of probably the hardest because that's when the major shift is happening. Uh, more questions from the floor? We still have five minutes. The question. Go ahead, please. I think I think there's a need for both because I think formal education provides structure. It it helps you learn some really critical things, such as critical analysis, how you view the world and break it down. It doesn't necessarily answer the questions, but it teaches you to ask the right questions. I think that's very important. But informal education is you going out and doing it, learning it. And that's critical too, because you don't learn about life by sitting in the classroom. You've got to go out and experiment. So I think it's definitely a combination of both. Uh, one is not going to suffice, even though we've heard the stories about people who never went to school and became hugely successful, but it scares me when people take that as the norm, because it's not. It's the exception. And if you're thinking you're the exception, then you're probably not. <laughs> so, um, If I may add to this, because I have my own experience with youth, I think formal education is important, but not in the format that we have, or that we have nowadays in, in, in our schools. Because what you're saying about crit critical thinking and, and all these things that should be in the, in the educational system, they don't exist right now in, in, in the Arab world. Uh, oh. 
except for Def food. Depends on what educational system you're talking about. Like for me, I, the educational system I came from really taught me. Where, where is that? I, I'm British educated. Oh, ah, okay. Yeah. So I'm talking about, about the, yeah. the yeah. Not, that's why I'm saying you gotta be careful because it's not, this is not a blanket statement. It really depends on. No, but in the region in general, yeah. and in public schools, basically, educational system has nothing to do with, with proper, a proper educational system. That's what, what I'm afraid to. Uh, we learned, this is actually quite interesting, and I, I, don't, I don't quite know what it's like in schools, but I learned about Richard Branson back when I was like, my first business studies class, like Richard Branson and Anika Roddick were the, the most major case studies that we learned about, and we were like 12 or 13. Um, so it existed in a certain format, right? But I'm not quite sure that that's the case in the, in the MENA region. I think you're right. It's not. I'm telling you. I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a victim of, of, uh, of the education system you in, in, good, in Jordan. did so don't victimize. Look at you. No, yeah, I was a victim people, at some point. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we have a question. Um, You know, I mean, <clears throat> to sound a little controversial here, I think, I think, uh, for some people, it's inherent. There's, they've got some inherent qualities about um, kind of acknowledging or understanding what their weaknesses are and what they need to know. So some people are just curious and by nature, and will go out there and and want to answer questions, and will Google and will learn and da da da. So you've got a you've got a percentage, of that. and 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 as I mentioned, I think generationally we're seeing more of that. Every generation that comes up or is younger is more curious. More doesn't, doesn't necessarily, you know, it's not the status quo. It's, you know, what I want to do as opposed to, you know, what you're telling me. So there are a little bit, and, and the access to information has become so huge. I mean, if I say to my friend, oh, what is this? They'll be like, Google is your friend. That's the answer now. Why are you asking? Google's right there. It'll tell you everything you need to know. So I think access to information, media, and kind of mentality, you know, the, the mentality and some of the inherent qualities that some young people have are already working in their favor in the sense of exploring what they need to explore to make better versions of themselves as business people. Uh, but that's obviously not for everybody. Um, from, my, from, me, from filling the gap point of view, and this is, this is kind of some of the work that I do, is that we try to connect the different dots in the ecosystem, which means when I run this mobile entrepreneurship platform in the vehicle of a competition. I don't care who wins at the end of the day. Of course there's money at the end of it. That's a motivator, it's a carrot. But really what we're trying to do is create this pipeline of young people with, with high potential and ideas and whatever and put them through this process where they're meeting um, accelerators and incubators and mentors and going through webinars. So they have this exposure to this entrepreneurship, uh, entrepreneurial environment um, and potential successful stories and people telling them what it takes. And that's kind of part of filling the piece. But then there's also a piece before us, which is, or even after us, which is training, you know, and, and actual training where you go and you, you, learn, you do business 101, lean methodology, and you go and you do 101, how to raise funding, and 101, you know, um, marketing strategy. In, and, and, and these are out there. They're, they're, they're in abundance, but there needs to be, um, the entrepreneur needs to recognize what they need and actually go there and acquire it. Um, from a formal perspective, like the educational systems, I don't think we're gonna be seeing a quick shift in that. I think slowly, slowly maybe. Yeah, so, but it's out there. About, like, I think in my modest opinion, the biggest challenge in the region is not the lack of these um, 
options for young people. It's the lack of collaborative environment amongst the service providers. So I'm an incubator, you're an accelerator, you're a training camp, da da da. We're probably working with similar groups of people. So instead of us coming together and collaborating for the best outcomes, really most of the time we're looking out after our own best interests. And that's, I think, where we need to strengthen our own ecosystem. All right, more questions? All right, thank you so much. Thank you, Thank you Dana.